Well, most children love to draw, as you, as you did too. Um, and the first exhibition I ever saw of your work that was included on the wall, and I remember it quite distinctively, um, a piece called The Fairground, which you uh, created when you were 12. Uh, now, as I said, I mean, kids love to draw, and they will draw, but then they drop out. You didn't. What, what, what kept you going? What, what was it that you kept uh, drawing and you wanted to draw? I probably found it was the easiest way to understand things, uh, the quickest way to work out who I was, where I was, what I thought about something, was to draw pictures. <laughs> And um, so when other people started to move into more serious subjects, mathematics or, or whatever it was, I just <coughs> continued to draw. And uh, all my books, therefore, all my um, you know, school books were filled with uh, little bits and pieces of, uh, of those sorts of things. And the, I used to get the uh, teacher's report, which always said, daydreamer, needs to concentrate more. I was just drawing, and so it made sense to me that if I wanted to work out how something, how something came together, or how all the parts all over the place would make the whole, I'd do a drawing of it. And I just kept doing that all the time. So I never actually started to draw, it's just a case that I never stopped. <laughs> Good. And your desire, of course, was to become an artist. And um, there was... There was an art school in Bath, yeah. but uh, you couldn't apply for it because although it was an art school or something, anyway, you'll share that with us. But you went to Cardiff. Can you share with us? Yeah, well, the reason I went to Cardiff was, was th at the time, these things are very important at the age of 18. I've been doing all these different jobs, um, anything from grave digging to working in the <coughs> post office to doing all sorts of things to get money in. And I had reached that stage where I wanted to go to art school. I had no idea really what would happen at art school. I just thought I was feeling a little bit isolated, a little bit alone, a little bit like um, I'm vulnerable. I'm 18 years of age and I'm a bit of a fish out of water. And I thought maybe art school is the places that I'm going to feel a little more, um, you know, meet more friends or whatever. So I applied for Cardiff because it was then... 70 miles away from Bath, which meant it was close enough to go back on the weekends if I needed to, usually to take my washing and stuff like that, and, you know, to my mum and dad, and so far enough away for me to be independent and be myself, but close enough just in case I got a bit too scared. So those things were very important in 18. By 19, they weren't important at all, but you do certain things at, at a certain stage in life because they're very, very important for you. And as it happened, Cardiff was a fantastic art school and very, very lively. And I should just add as well that when I went for an interview, I went with a truck full of art that I'd been making, and included paintings, drawings, sculpture, all sorts of things that I'd been working on. And as I drove the truck into the uh, Cardiff College of Art car park and opened the door, somebody looked into the work and said, oh, this boy's in, no need to look any further. Because the one thing they knew was I was committed in nothing else. <laughs> but whilst you were still at Cardiff, you'd actually virtually completed uh, your studies there then. Yeah. You applied for the Royal College of Art. Um, a thousand people applied for 18 places. Mm. And you got one. Yeah. Um, and you you got a burst. I mean, like he he, he had a, a grant or something. Yeah. Um, but that was minimal. So how did you exist when you got there? Because there was no extra money. No, but it was. It, I still had to do um, <laughs> summer jobs and Christmas post and work in the summer in factories and do other things to augment how much money I required. But I had just enough to survive and the idea was uh, that I was the first student from Cardiff College of Art 
to get to the Royal College of Art. And I thought that the staff would all come up and say, fantastic, well done, brilliant. And in fact, I worked out then, probably about 22 years of age, there was actually a bit of jealousy. And some of the staff had applied previously themselves and hadn't got in. And so I arrived in London, and um, in the back of the Victorian Albert Museum was a studio where, and the mural room where I went to paint. And um, I had a, I, I just survived. But, but the main thing was that I lived in, in a, probably uh, a room about as large as this, this little, you know, area here. But it didn't matter because I could go into the Royal College of Art and paint pictures on any scale I wanted. And people, even then, gave me canvases and, gave, and I just would paint on the back of things. And I could just keep working. And so it was, it was, I scrounged for everything I could, but it gave me a chance just to explore and make art all day and every day, which was wonderful. Because also because you had this work, total work ethic. Mm. Um, but w at the time you were there, well, it's different from when David was over there, um, your studies at, were frequently interrupted. <laughs> well, that was, that was a period of time, some would know, uh, in London at that particular period, 1973, 74, and that sort of period was the period where the IRA were at their most... Um, um, lively, let's say, and, and anybody would ring up with an Irish accent. And because we were in the Victoria and Albert Museum, it meant we all had to leave and get out. And so I spent months, and sometimes, you know, like three days a week, I would be going out of the Royal College of Art onto the streets, talking with other students, saying, come on, hurry up and find something. And then they'd give the all clear, and we could all go back in again and paint. So it was a quite bizarre time but it was that sort of period where as I say the IRA were the, uh, most active and any hoax phone call because it was the Victoria and Albert Museum and meant immediately they just say everybody out and then we and we tried to hide sometimes and hide around pillars and pretend and, and they say no you out and, so, <laughs> and we kept being dragged out all the time so it was a very strange period of time. And it would have interfered with what you'd actually Yeah, yeah, it's very frustrating, very frustrating, very um, frustrating. But also at that time, um, from what you shared with me earlier, David um, came and lectured. Was there, was there anything that you learned from him in that, at that time that you well, really I, stood out? Yeah, well, I've got to say that David was a, was a superstar then. And, um, yeah. and it was the period of time when... Um, uh, it was like youth culture. I don't need to tell people from Carnaby Street to, to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones to everything that seemed to be happening in the UK at that particular period. And David, I used to pick up the newspaper in the morning and see pictures of, uh, you know, Ringo Starr and David Hockney and Mick Jagger and David Hockney. So David Hockney was this super person. I walked into the Royal College of Art. And, and he'd be stood there saying, hello, Bernard, nice to see you. And it was almost unbelievable that I would be encountering people of that magnitude. And I was in awe. But I have to say David was um, wonderfully generous in spirit and um, acted as if he was, um, you know, had no reputation at all. It's, you know, it's wonderful when you meet people that are not full of themselves, and David wasn't. He was a very... Um, very sympathetic person. He, he taught me things like, don't worry about style and fashion. They disappear. Stick to what you're doing. It doesn't matter about fashion. doesn't matter how. Just keep doing the kind of things you want to do. And he also, also talked to me about perspective, and he talked to me about a whole range of things. But most of all, he was just an engaging, um, uh, quite introspective in some ways, person that was um, genuinely wanted to help and encourage students, and he was lovely to me. And I have, um, I've always remembered that period and the confidence that he gave me to continue on. And um, like many students, when you left the Royal College, um, and included it, you went to Paris, um, and you fell in love with it, of course, and you started painting. Yeah. Um, what, what was it that excited you about being in Paris at that time? Um, 
Uh, well, I didn't know before I went. I won this scholarship to go there. It was like a bursary to go across and to stay then at a place called the Cité International des Arts, um, which was a studio in Paris next to people internationally coming in to paint and draw, uh, and they were younger people and, uh, and creative people. So it was just a very exciting place to be. But what I, what I think I, I gained from Paris was that London um, was a dynamic, lively city, but it never occurred to me that London had been, because I never thought about it really, how badly London had been bombed in the Second World War, and therefore how much of it was missing or was, was disjointed. Whereas Paris was a cohesive, beautiful city, and you know your history of Paris, that it wasn't bombed. And, uh, you know, these famous pictures of the, uh, the, of the Nazis coming in and walking down past the Arc de Triomphe and things like that. But because, therefore, it, was, it didn't get bombed, it remains an intact, beautiful place. And so I enjoy just wandering up back streets and looking around uh, as much as I did the museums and the galleries and everything else that was there. And because I had a studio, and because I just had enough money, because I just sold a couple of paintings for the very early stage of my life, I had enough to be able to survive if I budgeted very well. And it meant that for nearly four months, without a tutor, without anybody telling me what to do or what not to do, I could just go and, and make art, which is what I did every day. I also enjoyed myself and went out in the town and drank too much red wine and all the other things that you do. But I really immersed myself in this amazing place. And even though I don't speak the language well, I found it really stimulating and exciting. In fact, I didn't want to come back to London, I must be honest about it. I would have willingly just stayed there because I just thought it was an incredible place. But I, I went, I say to people, I went as an art student and I came back as an artist. Yeah. Sure. Um, you painted place plus the first and third. Yeah. You painted it, you vetched it, yeah. they've sold tonight, so some lucky people are going to yeah. be able to enjoy that. Um, what is it about this small little place of Paris that you attracted you? And, and I know attracts other artists. David did uh, a photographic collage of the same place and other people. What, what is it about that particular place that attracted you to them? Well, I, I think initially what I, what I didn't want to do with Paris was to go up and paint the Eiffel Tower or paint the Arc de Triomphe or paint Sacre Coeur on the hill. I didn't want to deal with things which some people might see as perhaps cliche or, you know, a picture postcard Paris. I wanted to find little places myself. And I thought I'd discovered um, the Place de Furstenberg my, myself. And it's only, of course, when I got back, I realized that everybody had been there, including when I walked up the street and turned around the corner, there's a Delacroix Museum, where Delacroix used to live. So wherever you go in Paris, there's a sort of, uh, there's layers of history and layers of incredible artists that have lived their lives or have been very close to it. So for me, it was an intimate little place that I drew and painted, and I've come back and drawn it several times, and etched it, as you say, and worked it in different ways since. But it was an intimate spot that I personally liked, and that's what a lot of this work is. There are little places that I see as being something significant and special, and I'm trying to look at it, not therefore, as they say, these are not about um, postcards of a city, they're about exploring and moving through spaces, Maybe we'll talk about that in a minute. But those are the sorts of things. They're the intimate little moments that make up the total. Mm. And you met David yeah. at an exhibition at Yves Saint Laurent. Yeah. And you shared with me because she said he, he was talking to you mm. about his time at the Royal College of Art. Yeah. And that he was sharing something about his disappointment. What was that? Well, he said to me um, all those years on, he said to me, you know what was wrong with the Royal College of Art when you were there? And I said, no, what was it? And he said, it was they didn't have enough drawing. They managed to marginalise drawing, and so drawing was no longer the main core subject. And obviously when David was there, he used and made the most of the amount of drawing that you could do. 
it wasn't a case that drawing wasn't um, formally taught to a, a, on a postgraduate course, or it wasn't a case that there wasn't even any models. It was more about that it was said, do you want to draw a model, or oh, we'll organise something for you. It was it was not done in the in a manner which you, in a in other words it, you weren't made to feel excited about wanting to do drawing. It was a sort of thing. Oh, all right, well he still wants to do this. Okay, we'll 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 organise a model for him. So David thought that it was no longer centrally placed in an art school, and he mm. believed it should be central to all good teaching in art schools, mm. which is a debate which we could have today very easily. Mm. Um, I, I will just mention there that my father used to go to night school to do light and shade, okay. which nobody ever did. Right. And David was quite intrigued with that yeah. when, when he learned about light and shade. Yeah. But you included a painting, it's over there, um, uh, the Le Pont de Neuf, mm. and we briefly touched when we talked earlier about this, and, and about what you term time warps and delayed time. What do you mean by that? It's significant in your picture. Well, all, all of these works here, if I ha if they have to be explained, and a number of people have come up tonight and say, why are they sort of wobbling, or why are they twisting, or what are you trying to do, or whatever? It, it is about looking at something, not from one specific location, but a number of locations. In other words, I'm here, and I'm looking at um, you as the audience. But if I wanted to start drawing, I would also move over there and draw it from that angle. And I would also get down lower, so I'm drawing you higher up than me. And I try to integrate and put that information in together. So it's about, you can see around buildings that from one angle you can't. You can see around another space that you normally wouldn't be able to. So it's, a, it's taking into account the time, the time warp, mm -hmm for you to go from one side of the bridge to the other, or from one side of the square and sit down on the park bench next to it, or through, you know, one part of Restaurant Bernard and walk inside it. So I'm looking always at different angles and trying to bring them together to give you a fuller experience of the scene. Which we wouldn't capture the trap as a normal perspective. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, you actually then, Ret um, we're jumping a little bit, but you returned to England yeah. to teach, um, and it was a career that you were really, really passionate about teaching. Can you share that? Well, I, 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 I suddenly realised that I did know something about art after all this time of Cardiff College of Art and then the Royal College of Art, and I wanted to impart some of that enthusiasm, knowledge um, to that. But um, it, was, it was tough in those days because I was young and I was teaching half a day a week here and a quarter of a day there. And by the time I caught the train and done a bit of teaching and got the train back again, I'd probably broken even, you know. It was, they, were, they were tough days. And um, so I did that for a while and then, and then I got a lucky break, so to speak. You did. You went to the Commonwealth Institute mm. in Kensington. Yeah. I know it well. Um, and they offered you an exhibition. Yeah which was actually life-changing for you. Well, I met, that's right, I, I had a big exhibition there, and it was a prestigious place to be shown, but I met somebody there, because it was the Commonwealth Institute, that had links with um, Australia, and had links with, and had just become um, the Director of Education for the Northern Territory, Australia. And I said, any jobs in the Northern Territory? And he said, I'll, I'll, I'll look into it or whatever. And then it went quiet. And these are the days before emails and stuff like that. And he eventually wrote to me and said, there's a new art school which is just uh, starting in a place called Darwin. And they're looking for new people to go in and, and teach. Uh, would you be interested? And I thought, wow, this sounds exciting. I mean, why not give it a go? And I looked at the map of Australia, and at the age, I'm about 25 years of age, I looked at the map of Australia, and Darwin's in very big letters at the top, and I thought, <laughs> I heard, and then I thought, I've heard about cyclone, I don't know, anyway, as naively as I, as, as I could, I went, uh, I in the end said, I'll give it a go, and I went for an interview at Australia House in the Strand in London, 
and all the, th the three people that interviewed me had never been, uh, one of them had been to Australia before, and, uh, <laughs> Sydney or Melbourne, I think, and, uh, and, and the other two really didn't know anything about Australia at all, but said, well, if you want to do it, well, well, good luck to you, and suddenly I got this letter saying I'd been accepted. And it was only at that point that I realised I actually had to go. <laughs> and I, because I sort of wanted to prove that I could get a big job somewhere. And they were paying me a very big wage in those days. And they flew me out to Darwin. And I have never looked back in terms of, of loving Australia. I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in Darwin. But I did have a wonderful experience and time. And, um, and it got me... Well, I'm still here now, and I still thoroughly enjoy travelling and, and using Australia very much as my base. You did arrive, of course, just when the, uh, the hurricane had gone. That's there. right, yeah. Cyclone Tracy had been through about a year before, yeah. and what I hadn't realised is, is that, which is again obvious, that um, all the trees have been stripped bare. All the, you know, the flora and fauna had all been, uh, there's hardly anything left. And so there was, so there were trees stripped bare, as I said before, but also the birds were migrating in different patterns. And, so, and, and I was told, uh, and I'm sure you all know these stories, or some of you would, that um, the only people that, that, the only people that were left in the town were the white fellows. And they all stayed because they were all drinking because it was around Christmas time. The Aborigines all left. Um, so this tells you something about how instinctive and how, how they responded to their environment or how close they were to their environment and how we weren't. Uh, but I had, a, um, yeah, I had a wonderful time there. And um, it was um, a, a great experience because... I travelled from there, I had exhibitions in Sydney and then Melbourne and realised that there was a balance of uh, you know, places in Australia and, um, and I also realised that it's a little bit like how your bread is buttered, I knew that I could actually survive in Australia as an artist and at that time I thought very much that um, I was struggling to do that in Britain and I may have got there in the end, who, who knows, but it probably would have taken me a lot longer. But after four years, then you left Darwin yeah. and you went to Bendigo yeah. and you took up a position in Bendigo, which of course was closer to Melbourne. Yes. Um, and being able to go and visit exhibitions and show mm. some exhibitions. Yeah. Yeah, no, well, I found that, that I mean, uh, they, they were roughly the same size cities, uh, Bendigo and Darwin at that time. Um, but Bendigo was, as it is, old historical, um, you know, Celtic, uh, um, uh, you know, town which it, which got loads stacked with history. Very beautiful place, and um, the opposite in some ways of Darwin was um, yeah a very different kind of environment. So what I did when I got to Bendigo is yes I went to gallery openings. I did things in Melbourne. I'd come back in the evening and I and I commuted much more. And I had a job which was. Um, uh, inflated position of senior lecturer and head of fine art and things like that. So I was moving into that career path. However, the important thing to say, in spite of all the academic thing, is that the reason I was there, I knew, was because I loved making art and loved painting. And that's the thing that I continue to do um, in, in spite of and would find all hours and all times to be able to keep exhibiting and exhibiting in Melbourne and in Sydney and in Canberra, etc. And so after that, of course, you got some reputation by that time. Yeah. And you came up and you took the directorship of the National Art School in Sydney. Yeah. Um, and you were there for over 10 years. Now, you actually painted a picture which I, I looked at and it, it affected me greatly, this picture that you painted. It, you had virtually everything in the kitchen sink. Um, all your art were old pencils, uh, rulers, uh, canvases, you were struggling. It was night time, the stars were down, and uh, you didn't look happy in that picture. Can you share what it was about with that? I, I tend to paint pictures apart from celebratory pictures, which is really what this exhibition's about. I tend to, at certain crossroads, 
or dramas in my life, um, either leaving somewhere or moving to another city or things happening on a personal basis or death or whatever else, or the things that happen to us in life, um, I tend to make art about that at that particular moment. And that was a painting about leaving the National Art School, which I left with mixed feelings. I put a lot of time and effort, and I, I think I'd done a lot and achieved a lot in terms, politically to try to make an art school work. But it, I think if every day of your life you're constantly being told, why should we fund the National Art School by politicians... And, and if you're told all the time what's important about culture, why should we give money to this, after a while you really do feel like you're knocking your head against a brick wall and you really do feel like there must be something better to do than just keep talking to politicians that don't want to fund something. So I, it, there was a certain negativity, if you like, in that regard. And I felt, I felt a kind of that if I hadn't left when I did... Um, they would have probably carried me out, you know. I was, I'd, I'd given as much as I could to something which, which seemed to be a real, an uphill struggle, constantly to try to get funding for cultural activities, which to me was just so obviously important and crucial to our well-being and to society, but somehow or other I didn't seem to be able to get that through to the politicians of the day of all persuasion. But you also met Wendy. Yes, I did. That's the that's, that's <laughs> plus. <laughs> so you met Wendy. Yeah. And that also made some changes. Yeah, it did. Of course, it, didn't it, Wendy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it was uh, a terrific time in that regard. And um, we, we got together in around about 2000. So we've been together for quite a while now. And because, and I know Wendy makes these comments as well, and asking what, what's it like to have two artists, or two ambitious artists, um, two headstrong artists working away in the studio. Um, well, we've got separate studios, and I think because Wendy was formed as an artist, and I was formed as an artist, if you like, as well, I knew what I wanted to do, she knew what she wanted to do. When we met, it was actually complimentary, and it was good. And we've used the strengths from each other and Wendy often will have conversations with me about composition or things like that because she thinks I understand some aspects which she might be struggling with in a particular work, although I think she's very good at composition. I talk to her about tone. I talk to her about um, other aspects of art, and, and I use her strengths and her ability to actually deal with light and shades and things, which I find tougher to come to terms with straight away. So we come together and complement each other in terms of what we're doing, but we don't, uh, although we're interested in the same subject matter, we're very different as artists and have very different things to say. And, and her success I applaud, and I know she feels good when I'm having a, a successful exhibition, which this is at the moment, so it's, it's all pluses, very good. You love Paris. You've got a little apartment there between. Yeah. Um, and this ex this exhibition exuberates all the passion that you feel when you're painting. Um, and the strength and colour and a lot of joy mm. um, in it. So what is it that stirs you to in include those passions in your picture? What is it? I just find Paris, as I said before, one of those places that does... It, it seems to have the greatest concentration of museums and galleries. It seems to be a place that respects culture as well. And I think does have an understanding or an empathy with the arts. Uh, alongside sport and other things, but not, uh, not in place of, uh, of that. And I think that that balance makes it a very interesting place. And so whenever I go there, I'm always diving off down back lanes or in certain little little corners and just sitting there and drawing or taking photographs, a combination of all that. And how I actually work is I sit there, sometimes on the riverbank, and just start drawing the things that I see around me. And then uh, I take that back and I take photographs as well. I go back to the studio. Sometimes I come out in the morning and take photographs and then in the evening because the light and the shadows are obviously different. But the combination of all that information I then start working up some colour works or pastels. And if I'm going to develop it further onto large scale work, that comes back to Sydney because uh, the studio in Paris is, is small. 
Um, and but it's it's wonderful to be able to start on ideas, embryonic ideas, and then bring them back to the big grand studio in Sydney and develop them through, as you can see on some of the larger works here. These works, as I say, were done on the spot. They were worked at at the time. They develop ideas that come from my own imagination. They take into account some of those things of time, walking through spaces and coming back again and drawing it from other angles. I love what David Hockney used to say about perspective, that he loved Chinese scrolls and he loved um, the way that Asians and other people have looked at perspective space. So you can go around a corner and draw the side of a building and then come to the other side and draw the other side and put it in a picture, which is illogical on one level in that you can't see that from one fixed point perspective. But I love the idea of being able to move through and around and involve myself into that kind of space. And these are, yeah, um, celebrations of a, of a beautiful city and something that inspires me. And every time I go back, I'm inspired by something else again. I haven't run it. We've had the studio space now for quite a few years in Paris, and we go there quite regularly. But as soon as I arrive, I think, oh, look, it's another picture. And off I go again. So I, I don't think I'm ever going to run out of um, creative energy when it comes to a place like Paris. But I think that, you know, these are universal on one level. They're a celebration of the humanity of a, of a very beautiful place and, um, and a way of being able, hopefully, to uh, gain your attention and make you feel um, special things about the work as well.